This interview is for information only and should not be considered as investment advice or a recommendation to buy shares in the company featured. Welcome to this stock box interview. Andrew Bell, the CEO of Red Rock Resources, is with me today. Andrew, how are you? Very well, thank you. Now, Red Rock have released some significant news from Australia. Yeah, yeah, we've had some news, and curiously, Fosterville South has come out with some news as well, which is just adds to the story. It's fantastic. So let's start with us first. Yes, go on. Uh, first thing is, we were going to be talking about listing in Canada last year. That's before when the Canadian market was really riding high, big premiums there, and Fosterville South was riding the crest of the wave, having just listed. And um, uh, it looked like that was going to be our best comparator, and that we thought we'd get our licenses quite quickly. In fact, of course, what happened is lockdown after lockdown after lockdown in Victoria, I think they're on their fourth now, or might be the fifth even, has meant that civil servants, including Earth Resources, were working from home most of the time. Of course, it slowed things up a bit. So it was only really the the first quarter, second quarter of this year that some of our licenses came through. And we needed that critical mass of granted licenses in order to get listed, we felt. By the time all that happened, we were looking at the London market and saying, look, it's very difficult to travel. Um, we would have to have some, do all the administration of running the listing with people we hadn't met before in Canada, and we'd have to be doing the marketing. And uh, on the other hand, if we do it in London, we know everybody. We're dealing with a team of people we've worked with before, expect to work with frequently in future, and uh, we know a response if they know us, and uh, we know the AIM system. It's, an, it's worth a thought. And Paul was the first, Paul Johnson of Power Metal Resources, our partner, was the first person to sort of spot this, start asking me questions. Are, we, are you sure we're doing the right thing listing in Canada? And at first I said, yeah, yeah, I think it's still a place where you've got the... And then he pointed out that ECR here was also a good comparator because it's nearly next door. People know it. It's performed reasonably well. It's been a, a fairly poor market the last few months and has a valuation of £20 million. And we thought, right, you know, they have a small percentage of our land holding, and um, we think w- what we cover, our footprint covers so many old mines and things that we compare very well with them. So we can kind of think, well, that's a floor price for us. We know we shouldn't be looking at less than a £20 million market capitalization. Of course, we think and hope it would be a lot higher. And so why don't we do... The listing in London. And then we said, yeah, we think we can do that. And we think uh, we, we, because we've already got the 43101 done, which is normally the long lead time item, we can actually expedite it in London, make it very fast. So we push the button and we're going. So do you feel you'll get more value then by listing in London as opposed to North America? Uh, yeah, well, we also, we, we know Paul in particular knows how to market in London. Mm -hmm. Um, We've got a really good team in Australia. And if we'd been doing it in Canada, I think we'd have felt obligated to put a chief executive in control who is a Canadian to do that marketing and everything there because none of us are there. Um, But having it here in London, having seen the superlative job that Dave Holden has, and remember Dave Holden's not in Australia. It's not just got a geology degree. He's also got an MBA and he's been public company director and managing director in Australia and Canada. Um, he uh, has done such a really good job of building a team and working with them and getting everybody doing really high quality geology on the ground. Three geologists, all of whom have worked underground at the Ballarat mine, as well as above ground, all who know, live in the area. So they really know it. And um, they're doing such a good job. I thought it would be such a shame to put somebody on top of him he should be doing that as sort of md type job and then what we can contribute in london uh paul and myself to some degree is we can contribute some of the marketing backup and liaison with uh, aim so we can get a really good team going by looking at everybody's strengths and putting them together so he said yes the chemistry kind of looks good 
We now we just need to put in place, of course, the right uh, non-execs, and we've identified one or two of them who will impress the market. And I think you know, we're looking pretty good. So what's the latest then from Australia? You've got some more license applications granted and some more pending. You've also got some drill-ready targets, is that right? Yeah, if you, if you don't count the tiny little inclusions um, in, within our licenses, which were state land, so we've got to get quasi-applications for those, but they're within our license area. Um, if you don't include those three to tiny little bits, um, we've actually been granted more than half our licenses and all the key ones bar one. So um, we're looking pretty good. And uh, we've been doing in two or three of those licenses, south of Ballarat, we've been focusing and we've done a lot of, uh, we've been testing whether the arsenic anomalism is a good pathfinder, comparing it with what's already known in other licenses, data from some other licenses, and doing some work of our own. And we've been also looking at old mines, doing research into them, doing 3D models of them, uh, uh, doing the georeferencing, of, putting them in exactly the right place, because not all of them are described correctly in terms of their location, and then relating it to what's visible on the surface, and actually walking the ground. Mm -hmm. And we've discovered really quite a lot. And I think, you know, you look at various things, we could do that. We could have a big discovery, we could have a series of, sort of small discoveries. Um, and But the thing that we think we can already see the way to is having two or three sort of deposits, like sort of pearls um, or string, separated from each other a little, but within five or 10 kilometers of each other, uh, where we already sort of know what should be there that wasn't taken out or that is uh, that. It, we think the indications are is that. So get two or three things like that, maybe two or three hundred thousand ounces each, string them together and have a central processing facility. Hey, we're already at a decent mine. And so we've got three locations associated with those mines um, where we have done the work, where we've done some soil geochemistry and um, ground studies, where we think we can start drilling straight away and one of them, we've even got drill hole locations, and we can do that before the end of the year. And if we are working on private land and more than 200 metres, for example, from a waterway, um, then we can be treated in the right areas as low impact exploration, so we don't need to go through the whole, you know, a permitting process. So we can book the rig now, <clears throat> and we need to, because they're getting booked up. So if we, we go now, we'll, we should have something in November. And as you know, um, we got all that ground near Ballarat, what you might call the brown fields, where below the surface mines, typical of the gold rush era of the 19th century, there is all the potential that in some areas, for example, up at Fosterville, have been proved where now they're below a thousand meters and they've been pulling out sort of one ounce plus gold in large quantities. Uh, and the, the better geophysics available, other you know, techniques, um, more drilling, um, public information that's there from other people's exploration, you begin to get a critical mass of data and information and interpretation that enables you to have a much better probably hit rate in finding things. It's still going to be hit and miss. Um, but we've got all that brownfields, but we've also got to the east that big license, Kilmore, which is a conceptual target because you've got a whole lot of these north-south structures that have governed the mineralization of Bendigo and Ballarat coming through and they're bunched together. So there's obviously a lot of folding there, deformation, and um, there hasn't really been gold exploration in the past. Now, I think that's because there's more cover there. Mm -hmm. And the one place we did find something called Donnybrook, an old mine, uh, it was a very narrow vein but it was grading up to four ounces plus a ton. Um, it was actually close to a watercourse, so probably there'd been some erosion, um, so it was more accessible. Or people started in the stream, great stream set, you know, looking at samples from the stream and traced the gold to where it had come from. But I don't think that's going to be the isolated occurrence there. There's going to be other stuff, 
but it'll be undercover, so we will have to go and look for it. But very exciting because the potential is so great. And if you look to our north, other people are talking up, bug big companies talking up ground further up there along the same structures, along the same trend. And then this morning, just to the east of that big license, Kilmore, literally just to the east, Fosterville South came out with uh, some results and they had 11 meters at one ounce a ton, sort of 31 grams a ton, including four meters at 80 grams a ton. So um, that's from their drilling there. So I think that completely validates our hypothesis that apart from the brown fields, a little to the west uh, around Ballarat, you go to the east along the structural north-south trend and you've got uh, green fields exploration which on structural grounds looks highly prospective mm -hmm. and where there are signs of gold. Mm -hmm. And just to the east of that, literally just to the east, we got some results out this morning. So that reinforces the picture, the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I think we're in, you know, we've got the right people mm -hmm. in the right place at the right time. And I hope that with London, we're coming to the right market. So how close are you to Fosterville? Well, the Fosterville mine is up to the north because that's east of Bendigo. Mm -hmm. And Bendigo is to the north of Ballarat. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're looking at it here, here's Bendigo mm -hmm. and here's Ballarat and all the structures are this way. Mm -hmm. And then you go east from there and here's our license there. Fosterville South is up there and um, the area they've been drilling is just here. Okay. Um, but most of our stuff is here around Ballarat, okay. Okay. all around the old mine. Okay. So what stage then are these license areas at? Is it still very early stage? I mean, you've mentioned some historical data. When do you think you'll be able to get more of an understanding of the geology in your license areas? Um, I think that as we progress, you know, that, that's going to be expressed in the announcements and it was expressed in this announcement too. Um, you've got some fairly typical mineralization of the Bendigo Ballarat type, which is sort of a lot of folding, and um, you've got this mixture of folding and faulting of the relationship between them, and what they call saddle, you know, restructures. Mm -hmm. And um, you uh, uh, then you have got some quartz veins that just sort of carry on going down and. In the old days, they would have stopped with them when they reached the water table or became too expensive pumping, or whatever. But um, yeah, you know, I think this is a matter when, when you're talking about that, you move from talking about conceptual mm. to the fine detail because mm. every deposit, every mine is different. So you'll start to get more of an idea then in November when the drill rig gets on site? Well, yeah, I think we'll get confirmatory drilling there. But we're starting out from what we know to what we nearly know, and that's where the drilling will be. And then, you know, stepping out from that to what we might know or we think is feasible will probably be the f step after that. So towards the end of the year then is when things start to become more interesting. They do. So would you say you're quite lucky then to have acquired these license areas in the Victoria region in Australia? Um, it was serendipitous. I wouldn't describe it as purely luck, but we wouldn't be so immodest as to describe it as purely skill. Uh, the timing was certainly right, but it was serendipitous. Uh, but I think the basic concept of looking at the Victoria Gold Rush country, um, where you had one of the biggest gold rushes in history. I mean, Australia wouldn't be Australia without that. Melbourne was built with the profits from that. You can hardly underestimate the importance of this for sort of Australian history and but because it was so long ago you know the 19th century people have kind of forgotten it mm. and um, I think going back to something that where they were looking then at things which were very near surface or effectively at surface where there was surface expression and of course nature doesn't just put things mm. um, at, at the surface as it was in the mid 19th century, the structures that produce this gold and the pathways through which it's come, um, they, they go deeper. 
but sometimes because of the folding of the faulting, it may be elusive. Uh, and the further you get from the ground, the more difficult it is to mm. find. And uh, certainly with the techniques they had available to them at the time, it was very expensive to take a blind chance. It's much easier mm. now. And is that why then there is renewed interest in this region? Because new technologies are allowing you to see underground that perhaps couldn't be seen before? Yeah, I mean, I could. there's a long version of the answer to that. There's a short version, but both... Both of them are basically a yes. And how are you feeling then about the Australia project? Um, extremely confident. You know, and our geologists working there are getting more and more excited, I would say, almost by the day, certainly by the week and by the month. Um, I, I think that the chances that we, we strike, you know, strike out completely, that we are completely unlucky, are, I would say, fairly small. Mm -hmm. There's a lot there that we can get our teeth into. Um, that it's not going to be, um, things are not going to be disproved in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this has legs, yeah. In terms of the gold market then, what's your opinion on where that is and, and where it's heading? Well, the, the thing is there are so many smart people buying and selling gold. It's difficult to be smarter than them. Um, and uh, the gold market, the gold price as it is today, reflects uh, a, a balance between buyers and sellers, optimists and pessimists, uh, smart people on both sides, and you know, whoever's right will slightly be shading it in terms of their understanding today. Um, I, I am, I am a bull. I think, I, uh, I think the price is going up. I can't see very much downside. I can see that um, not enough new gold is being discovered or produced. And um, a lot of mines are quite short life, so without investment they don't get replaced. Uh, and uh, you know, I think we've, we're moving from an era where people started to trust governments and government money since the 80s to one where it's quite evident you can't trust governments uh, anymore. They have developed the theory that you can spend as much as you like and print as much money as you like and it's magical, it has no effect. Governments can do it. There's, it's kind of new economics, um, favored by some sort of people with some certain political views in this country in America. Um, and it is, of course, based on the era of extremely cheap money in the era of QE, when governments discovered that by manipulation of the system, they could issue large amounts of money at the same time keep interest rates low. Whereas the orthodoxy of the sort of era of Margaret Thatcher and the Labour government before and so on, was the newspaper columnists would all say, ah, oh, the government's printing more money, interest rates will have to rise, and the bond market would get scared, and so on. <coughs> Which is why Hamilton Jordan, I think it was, you know, who, who was that advisor to um, Bill Clinton, who said that he, if he came back to as a second time, as reincarnated. You'd like to be reincarnated as the bond market because then you could terrify everybody. Okay. Well, that's changed because governments control the bond market instead of being terrified by it. But this is uh, some, there's a temporary effect. Um, it has led them into a sort of complacency where they think they can carry on uh, expanding the balance sheet of the central bank and creating more money. It'll never have effects. But once money comes back into being spent, uh, and you know, whereas it, you could insulate the QE in the early stages by keeping it within the financial system, more or less, um, and by buying you know, by bonds, the, the, the money creation since uh, COVID has been injected right into the bloodstream. You're mainlining money. Uh, and the only thing is that because people have been stuck at home, they've been building up savings ratios, instead of spending it. Um, but I think inflation is coming back. And when it does, there will be a marginal propensity to like gold a little bit more. And in terms of investing in red rock resources, what are the key things to look out for? When do you think the listing in Australia will happen? And what's your view on the rest of this year? Well, you know, we should be looking, unless somebody really does a bad job or doesn't do things quickly enough, uh, we shouldn't have much difficulty meeting a two to three months time frame. So 
I think we should be judged on that. Having said we're going to do it, having said we're going to do it fast, having said we then want to be drilling in November, um, we should be held to that. Um, yeah, okay. because this is something we should be able to do. We've got the professional expertise, the experience, um, the knowledge. We've got the assets. There's, there's, n there's no showstoppers there. Nothing is going to be difficult. So that would be the aim. Okay. Andrew Bell, the CEO of Red Rock Resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this Stockbox interview. For more information, interviews and videos, visit our website at stockboxmedia.com or give us a follow on Twitter by searching at Stockbox Media.